Daniel is leaving, but discussions is uh, ongoing. So, because I would like to give floor to Ralf Tumi from the Imperial College. He is a part of Climate Europe team. And La Ralf would like to discuss with you the latest developments in climate services. Ralf, are you there? Yes, hello. Can I just check my, my team is all there. So um, we're gonna be a team which is gonna present a report to you. And the way we're gonna organize it is that there's four of them and they're gonna talk to you about uh, what developments they haven't identified in various uh, subject areas. And so first uh, was Jeanette, uh, Marta, Vladimir and Eric. And I can just see Eric has appeared. So good, I was a bit worried about that. Okay, so what, the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna get every, every that we have four speakers. So each of those are gonna talk maybe for seven minutes about um, this report. There was a link to the report um, if you had a chance to, to read it or you can look, look at it afterwards. And they're basically four sections. So there is a, a, a review of the market, the market research, there is a section on modeling, latest developments in modeling. There is a, a section on observations and they roll their play climate services. And then we have something around integration, how we integrate modeling with services. So straight away, I'd maybe, um, if we can start with uh, Jeanette to introduce her findings on the marketplace. Jeanette. Will you show my presentation or shall I share my screen there? If I uh, probably best if you do it, yes, okay. I'll try to do that. Uh, share screen and then I have to take a look. Yes, and it's complete screen. So I can see it. Yes, okay, here it is. Um, I will tell something about. Um, uh, the, um, the chapter on uh, market research uh, on climate services um, in the document which you got the link from. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it would be good to explain what they understand uh, when they, they speak about the market. Uh, some people have a very limited uh, definition of the market for climate services, then they only think of the charged services. Uh, but in this case, in both projects, EU Max and the Marco project, which finished uh, slightly more than a year ago, uh, they had a very broad definition of uh, markets for climate services. They also included the uh, research and development for climate services, the charged public, uh, the charged services, and the uncharged services, and both from the public and by private companies. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, well, they made an overview of the current market and the prospects. Uh, the current market, and that was in about 2018, was uh, 3 to 9 billion euros per year in Europe. And uh, the growth rate was rather high, uh, 9 to 10% per year. And for the future, they expect it to be uh, 3 to 5%. Um, by now, still a large part is financed by the public sector and about 30 to 35% by the private sector, but in the future, this may change. Um, the current services are focusing especially on the, the sectors that are mentioned here, but there's still more sectors where new climate services could be developed, developed for. Uh, they also made a, an, op an overview of obstacles. Um, and you can divide them into obstacles for uptake and ob obstacles for delivery. First, the uh, obstacles for uptake. Uh, what you still see that there is a misfit, uh, at least in some cases, so with the use of requirements, especially the time horizons used, uh, 2050 is extremely long term for many people, uh, whereas uh, many uh, users would like to have something for the next uh, season or maybe the, the next five or 10 years. Uh, they also would like to have more information about quality and what they, the users understand uh, quality is sometimes different from the definition of quality by researchers. And uh, what is also important for many people is that information from dis different disciplines is combined and they don't have to search for all the different elements in different places. 
Um, there's also a lack of background knowledge. So people, users, often don't know how to use the information. Um, and another point is that uh, there's also still a lack of awareness of the impacts of climate change. So people are not thinking that they need climate services. At the same time, you also see that there's a lack of incentives to use climate services, although um, with the, the need to have a national adaptation uh, strategies, I think that there are more incentives now. Um, what you also see is that uh, many people undervalue the benefits of uh, climate services. That's probably also due to the fact that uh, well, people often look at the financial values, but there are also other values, uh, social values, for example. And what makes it difficult to use the information or to use the, the climate services is that people often don't know where to find it. And there's no good overview of the available climate services. And sometimes the costs limit the, uh, the use of the climate services. Then the obstacles for development and delivery. Uh, so that's from the other side of uh, the climate services. Um, um, what you see is that there are often aren't really standards, but they're missing. Uh, standards on quality, for example. Uh, if they would be there, I think it would be, there would be more uh, services that could be developed. Sorry, I have to go back. Yeah. Um, for some uh, climate service providers, there's also a lack of the availability of easily usable climate data and information. Um, uh, it costs them a lot of uh, effort to, to get the, the data, the basic data, and uh, to process the data, and then it's not interesting anymore. Uh, there's also a lack of expertise to integrate information from dis different disciplines that requires a multidisciplinary team, and uh, that's not always available. Um, there are also sometimes limitations, legal limitations, for some governmental providers. For example, I work for KNMI and we had a discussion about local information. We are not allowed uh, always to provide our own local information uh, to the public. Um, lack of interesting business models. I think that's also a really important one. And uh, sometimes there's also lack of user requirements. Um, and I think that's also very important. There are many climate services developed already but there are limited resources for further operationalizing them. And the last slide, um, there are many opportunities to further develop climate services. And I think that's also really needed. But if you look at it, you can uh, use different um, approaches to, to stimulate the development of climate services. And uh, one is uh, more state-centered, the other is more business-centered and network-centered, and depending on um, what you, you focus on, there are different uh, measures that have to be taken or that are the most logical ones to be taken. So, um, um, yeah, depending Jeanette? on what people want, yeah. Jeanette, I think you yeah. should state that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this comes from the Marco project, right? Yes, this yes, graphic. yeah. Yeah, most of what I uh, presented comes from the, uh, this one is especially, I think, the Marco project, but the EU Max and the Marco project uh, delivered most of the research on uh, climate services markets. Yeah, I think, I think you should note it somewhere as the source of the information. Yeah, I, at, and the start, I indicated that uh, the EU Max and the Marco project uh, uh, were the most important projects for this, but um, well, it's good to make it clear that uh, the information is from these projects, especially. Yes. Okay. Um, well, maybe you think there are some things missing that um, uh, obstacles, for example, or uh, you have ideas on, on how to uh, promote further use of uh, climate services or development of climate services. Um, I think, Ralph, there, the idea is to have a short discussion on that. Well, I think what we'll have now, just to change it a little bit, we, we're going to try and launch a poll. So yes. we have a okay, question, yeah. um, okay. and then maybe that will stimulate some, some debate. Yes. 
So I think I'm waiting for, so can I, okay. So. Ralph, you all should be able to see the poll question now. Yeah. And maybe it's good to mention that uh, the people that uh, joined through uh, the, the Zoom app will see it, but the ones that uh, joined through the, uh, the browser, uh, they cannot see the poll. I don't remember putting both in the question, Paula. Uh, apologies where both, then. Where did both appear? <laughs> that's a, that's a problem. Okay, maybe we we'll, can we can we relaunch it? Um, I don't think I can edit it. Oh, you can relaunch it. Fly. You want me to stop this, do you? Well, let's let's let it run, but then let's relaunch it and and tell people not to vote. Not to, to use both. both. Okay. It doesn't really help. <laughs> So we've only got half the attendees have voted. So I don't know how long you want to keep it going, Paul. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll end it and we're going to relaunch it and everybody please make, it, make a choice between public and private because that was the intention. intention. Okay, I'll relaunch it now. So vote again. Do not vote for both. We still have uh, both as an option. I know, but do not vote for it. Two people. Yeah, I can't edit it in the middle of the poll, sorry. Well, most people are listening. So it's a running tie at the moment. Gosh, it's completely tied. We have 48, 45 in favor of public. 47, 47%. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. That just reflects that we don't have a clue, actually. <laughs> well, um, it's interesting. So I didn't, I didn't expect that. So that's interesting. So, so basically, we we think that that both are equally uh, going to contribute to future growth. And maybe to, just to kickstart the discussion, Jeanette, I was struck by the the decreased growth rate of climate services going forward. I mean, that growth rate is no bigger than the GDP before coronavirus. I mean, not much bigger. So why is climate services not growing faster than the economy? What's going on there? Um, well, it depends very much on, um, on several things. But uh, well, the GDP is important also for the growth rate and uh, whether obstacles uh, for uptake and delivery uh, can be um, uh, removed or not, and um, and there was. It also depends very much on the awareness. Uh, if people are aware of climate change and the impacts, uh, then maybe it may grow uh, faster. Okay, but I think the range you gave was never more than the range it had been. Right? It's definite deceleration. Yeah, but maybe it's also because there has been a, a, a large growth uh, in the recent years, and then in general it decreases. Uh, I think. Okay. But then maybe people from the the project can give more um, explanation about this. Anybody? I know that Yaroslav was included in uh, in the project. Uh, Good morning to everybody. Just you know, uh, I was not involved in Marco, and uh, and those forecasts come from okay. Marco. Yeah. Not less. I was included in the, uh, involved in the EUMAX, which yeah. looked into market barriers and opportunities. But you know, as a general comment, I I don't think those you know the assumptions and the reasoning behind the, you know those forecasts. Um, are still valid, either like, you know, because of the COVID nineteen, because of the recovery package, uh, because of the current sense of urgency. I think uh, those forecasts should be revised and updated. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They were from two thousand eighteen, I think, uh, when the projects uh, made their final reports. Uh, so, so, Roger had two quick questions. Does all the growth include private sector and outside Europe? Were they global projections and were they including private? I think it was for Europe. Um, okay. And it included the private sector, presumably? Yeah. yeah. 
Right, any other questions on, um, on those market surveys? You can raise your hand or you can put a comment in the sections or just uh, speak up. Yeah, just perhaps if I may add to what I said before, I mean, as we speak about the legacy of Climate Europe, I mean, uh, of course, any market intelligence uh, requires that and periodic update. So, you'll, uh, you know, that might be taken up also in the thinking on if there is Climate Europe network uh, preserved in some way or Climate Europe 2.0, uh, you know, to, to make these regular market intelligence reviews uh, might be very important. Yeah, the idea from the Marco project was also to have some kind of a climate service market um, observatory where these kind of updates could be made, I think. Okay, so I don't see any other questions for Jeanette. So maybe we'll move on to the next section, which is Eric. Are you there, Eric? talk about latest developments in modeling. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Ralph, and hi, everybody. Uh, Erik Kjellström from the Swedish Met Office. Uh, I'm, uh, I was uh, responsible for the part on, on the modeling in, in, the, in the report, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we have included in that uh, chapter of the, of the report. So climate models and the earth system models, as we take it, is kind of the scientific basis or a, a scientific basis for the more tailored information needed and used in, in climate services. And uh, we have a section first in, in the report on, on, uh, on climate model development and updates and, and how these models are progressing over time. So uh, as we all know, and it's well documented, there is a continuous more or less process of in improving the parameterizations and these models. Uh, the horizontal resolution gets higher as well in terms of as we get better and better computing power. So there is an improved performance in many aspects re relative to, ob to observations that we have seen over time. And also these models are now uh, getting more and more complex. So we are involving more and more processes. And, uh, of, and these are processes that are of course relevant also for the climate and the climate change uh, questions. And in addition to that, to those two aspects, also the, the protocols that we are using for, for, for setting up uh, experiments and running the models, they are of course also evolving over time. And there is a lot of effort put into to these protocols and also how data is going to be shared and uh, so that the results can be exploited in a good way. And, and all of this, it leads to the fact that as we see it, that, the, that these models get, they get more and more suited for, for uh, being used now also for questions related to uh, climate mitigation. And uh, in terms also with the better resolution and the better representation of extremes, for instance, they get better to, uh, they are more suited to use for, uh, for instance, for work on climate change adaptation when it comes to extreme events, for instance. And uh, also the, the provision and, and the storage of data and more relevant data for, for different purposes, it also make, contributes to making these models better and better for climate services perspectives. So we have a section in, in the report about uh, the, the more coordinated work in terms of the CMIP activities, the coupled model into comparison projects and uh, notably now CMIP 6, which is the last uh, big project that is still uh, ongoing. And uh, this CMIP 6 is a very big endeavor in the scientific community with the model, I think it's a bit more than 20 different model intercomparison projects with different themes, uh, all constituting this CMIP 6 activity. And uh, when it comes to CMIP 6, if we relate it to CMIP 5, which was the main bulk of data for that was used also like in the last the previous IPCC reports now this CMIP6 models they, the models are better they have been uh, run at high resolution there are many different ex experiments uh, so we see many improvements there uh, but we also see that many of these models they have uh, actually a higher climate sensitivity so the range of climate sensitivity appears to be larger now compared to in CMIP5 in the models and this has been documented in some papers in the literature so it's it will be very interesting to see now what the IPCC comes up with next year in terms of the uh, 
I can't. I can't. Start, I can't. Uh, I have. I have uh, something in the chat here with the camera, but I can't turn it on from my side. So I, I tried to, but it needs to be done probably centrally from from who one who is uh, controlling the session. So I leave it with that for the time being. I can't start my video. Yeah. Now. Okay. Now I can start. Okay. So here I am. Sorry about that. So. Uh, okay. So. The climate sensitivity in many of the Earth system models are is uh, different compared to what it was in Siemens 5, and the and the range is slightly bigger. And we have also seen that the scenarios that ha have been run in uh, CMIP 6 with these new SSPs, uh, even if they have the nominal same radiative forcing as the RCPs, actually the CO2 concentrations and the and the pathway into the the rest of the century is different compared to before. And that also adds to uh, higher and stronger warming compared to in, in CMIP-5. So many of these new scenarios now show stronger climate change signals compared to what we have seen before. And this is, of course, interesting in a climate service pr pr perspective. How can these new results be understood and how can they be communicated and also in relation to the previous CMIP-5 results that everything is based on uh, up until now, basically. Uh, one part uh, with the climate models is of course about evaluation and we have a subsection on that also in the, in the report and uh, this is very much important or very much depending on this coordinated efforts, these coordinated experiments again like the CMIP experiments and of course also the observations with, which we will hear more about uh, later by, by Vladimir later. Uh, but there has been a lot of development also in this area, also from the climate modeling side, working on, on common tools for climate model evaluation to put the models against the observations. And there are examples like, such as the ESM valve tool, which has been now becoming more and more commonly used between different climate modeling groups, all in order to make uh, the comparisons, the, the evaluation done more swiftly and also maybe more, uh, yeah, more efficiently. Uh, there are two, some other aspects also of, of climate models and their use for, for climate services. We also have the shorter time perspective and the climate prediction time scale. That is from, uh, say, from a month and up to maybe a decade, something like that. So now we are talking more about initialized uh, climate simulations and, or initialized forecast, actually. So there has also been a lot of progress in, in that area over the last uh, years, and uh, it, it very much relates again to increased computing power. We have better models at higher resolution, and they have also been run many more times. So the ensembles are, are getting larger, and that means that we have better ability to, to address questions about natural variability. And also uh, things like uh, uh, more frequent initializations of these forecasts is also something which has been addressed as, as being very important since the models, they, they get a shock from the initialization and there are also drifts in the models that needs to be taken care of in, in that uh, aspect. Uh, so there are some projects here like the UCP project ongoing now, it's a horizon project where, where these issues are being uh, dealt with also. And there is also an activity, I think, under the Copernicus Climate Change Service, there is a tender out now for also for looking into this climate prediction uh, business. Finally, I will just say a couple of words also about downscaling. There is also the activities around CORDEX, which is the Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment uh, that involves uh, both dynamical models, uh, regional climate models, but also empirical statistical downscaling methods. And there is a lot of activity also in, in that field. And uh, for the dynamical models, which I know most about, most, most about we have uh, activities within Eurocortex where there is a very large now matrix of combinations of global climate models downscaling, downscaled by different regional climate models. And uh, at a high resolution, this is 12 km, 12.5 kilometer over, over Europe. Uh, these ensembles are getting support both from Copernicus, but also from national initiatives and other funding sources. So it's a, it's a very good database for, that exists for Europe now for different uh, impact studies and, and, and also for use in, within climate services. Uh, Cordex also has a lot of interesting activities ongoing, uh, like uh, they have a couple of flagship pilot studies and there is one on the Alpine region in Europe where so-called convection permitting models are being used. These are models that are at very high resolution, much higher than, than the, the, the Eurocortex models at 12 kilometer. Now we're talking about say two or three kilometer grid resolution. And uh, it means that the, the deep convection can be really 
modeled explicitly by these models and they need, needs not to be parameterized. And these models have be frequently been shown to be perform much better compared to the coarser scale models and also actually to change the climate change signal for some extremes. And this is really has, can have a very high impact on, on the message that, that we try to convey from these models. Uh, there is also another flagship pilot study in, in Europe called LUCAS, and it uh, evolves around uh, land use and land use change, which has also been very important historically over Europe. And it might be very inter interesting in the future also in terms of uh, connection to mitigation and, and uh, yeah, the production of biofuel and, and possibly VEX, etc. So, so that's also a very important and interesting activity. Uh, the Cordex data and, and use has been used a lot and assessed and is now also being uh, used for as input for the IPCC process and it will be make part, be part of the, the atlas actually coming out of the next IPCC report. Um, yeah, I think I will stop that. I, I will just make, say as a final word here on the, on the regional climate models, but also on, on the other, other methods of downscaling. There are always, of course, uh, potential issues with, with the consistency issues between the, the global scale models and the regional models of the downscaling methods. So that the, it's, it's very important to, to really analyze in detail the, the final uh, results coming out on the local scale, which is what is maybe most interesting to the uses of the climate services. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so we're going to launch another poll and then we'll open up for, for discussion. So Paula, can you launch the second poll? Let me know when you can see it, Ralph. So it's, yeah, I can see it. So have the improvements in modeling improved the provision of climate services? Yes or no? So we've got 89 people. Let's see if we can get some more people to click a button. I think this is quite an important question because it's sort of an implicit assumption that we continue funding basic research because if we think that actually improving modeling doesn't improve services, you've got to, you've got to ask the question, you know, what, what is the appropriate use? So it's interesting, there's a side, I mean, at the moment, there are like, there's a quarter of people think that actually doesn't make much difference. Most of you think it does, but it's a sizable fraction that uh, I think so. I've only got 47, so again, we've only got half the people. If you haven't voted, please do, it's free. No charge. Use your democratic right. Is the poll closed? Or was there a timer? Yeah, it must be a timer on it, so unfortunately it has closed. Okay, well, I guess we'll have a representative sample of nearly half. So you, do you want to sh I'll share the results? People can see. Also, Ralph, I don't think people in the web browser can vote very easily. I think it's just if you're in the app, just to let you know, that's why you won't get 100% voting. Yes. So what you could do for people who haven't used, can't see via the yes, app, the yes, they no. could use the yes, no buttons. So if you want to read the question again, and then those people who haven't been able to vote because they're coming through the browser, please click either the yes or the no button, which you can find when you click on the participants and it brings up a list of participants. So, yeah, so I'll ask the question again, and there's a yes, no. How, have the improvements in modeling improved the provision of the services? Yes or no? Click but please yes. do not vote if you've already filled in the poll. Question isn't accurate enough. It depends whether you think trust is part of the service, but maybe we can talk about that. Seven to one. Okay, right. So, um, so I think a sizable chunk there, about a quarter, think the suggests that the modelling isn't really the the bottleneck here in the services, and and uh, but, but clearly the majority think that uh, improved modelling brings better services. So um, thank you for that. Um, maybe Eric, to start off the discussion, I guess one of the one of the barriers when you talk to people that want to use the service or not is often they say, "Well, it's 
it's so uncertain. I don't know what to do. You know, the uncertainties are so large. I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of a get out clause to say, well, nobody really knows, therefore I'll do nothing. And I, I guess the climate outcome, the modeling, I wouldn't say guilty, but the outcome of the modeling hasn't really narrowed uncertainties a lot. I think that's one of the conclusions that people have come to that, you know, that our projected change, the global mean even hasn't really changed and the uncertainties around that haven't really changed. So how, how do you see that in terms of, I think we had a question here as well about, you know, does it give confidence? But we haven't really changed the uncertainties very much. So how does that, how does that work? I think it's uh, to, 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 it's partly true what you're saying. I mean, the, the, the overall uncertainty has maybe not changed. Uh, we, we still have numbers on, on the spread of like the global mean temperature, which are is quite large. And now I, I also talked about CMIP6 results and models have, having a wider span again. Uh, but we should also remember that the, the climate models nowadays, they, they include many, many more processes compared to the models used in the, in the 70s and, and the 80s when these ranges were first, uh, when we first came up to these ranges. So uh, yes, the, the uncertainty ranges are still about the same, but on the other hand, we also, we have, it's much more confined in a way since we have more of the climate system in, in these uncertainty ranges. So we are more, we are more certain about uh, what we know, even if there is still a, a large degree of uncertainty around it. And I think that's an important message that we, we know more and we are more confident what we can say, but of course, we still have a very large uncertainty about the future. That's, that's, that's one way of expressing it. So we've got a couple of uh, comments here for Mark Payne from Denmark. So he says, at the moment, there are other barriers to developing or uptaking climate services. The models will be a barrier at some point in the future, though. Yeah, I can ag agree with that. I think there, is, there, are, there are, of course, a number of barriers. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it's also related to models. It also relates to the data actually being stored and, and these protocols I mentioned before. Uh, we do... I can take an example now from a Swedish project I'm working in and we, uh, towards the, the wind industry in, Sve in Sweden, the wind power industry. And, and uh, very much of the climate model data that are out there on the ESGF nodes and, and available, they are, they are not at hub height, so they are at 10 meter level. Uh, there are some exceptions, of course, but there is a kind of discrepancy in, in what kind of data we are providing compared to the data that is really requested. So, there is still a, a very strong need, I, as I see it, for, for, for really strong interaction between climate, models, climate models and data providers and, and the people who are interested in using these data to, to, make, to make it better. So that's, that's one obstacle, which I think is maybe one of the major ones. So, we, so Alberto had a couple of comments. You can, you can, if you unmute yourself, you can make the comments if you want. Maybe more interesting to hear some more other voices as well. Not that it, Eric's dulcet tones or... Right. Yeah, thanks. Alberto, yeah? Yeah, thanks, Raf. Yeah, no, I was just kind of making two points. One is, uh, yeah, one question is what happened in the past uh, that has have led to the situation where we are developing climate services now and whether the same rate of development is required for the future. We, I mean, this is a question I don't know the answer to. And also, yeah, the, the appetite comes eating. So the uh, thing we are seeing also that people using climate services will ask more and more um, you know, uh, fine, um, refined questions. So there, there's probably going to be need for more development as we move on. But at the moment, I think uh, I agree also there is more to do on the climate service side. So maybe Rasmus last, I think we're sort of heading into the time. Yeah. Rasmus, if you want to make some comments. Yeah, well, I, I, I think uh, uh, of this in terms of information and basically we try to maximize information that we have or we have various sources and some are more limited than others. Uh, simulations and model climate models are, are good, but they have like say minimum school for scale, they have a limitation. Then you also have the observations which are useful for in, in many respects. So to combine these in, in different ways, you can actually try to get a better, more complete picture. So one example that I want to bring up is that when we talk about climate services, we cannot provide information on a very high resolution uh, in, 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 temp uh, in spatial scale. But yes, we can with observations, it's not that difficult, but with models, it's, it's quite difficult. So yeah, it's, it's more of, of actually bringing together all the information that we have together to make the, the sense, out, sense uh, of it, really. Um, so. Uh, 
But this takes a lot of discussion with the end users. What do they actually really, really need to know? What are the numbers they really make use of at the end? Very few people make the use of time series to make decisions. They want, an, uh, say, a number for probability or, like, say, a return value or something like that. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Can I quickly comment on Rasmus' uh, comment there? I think it's really essential what you're saying, Rasmus, to combine information from, from models and observations in, in various ways. And, and some, in some places we know that the, of course, the observations, they are observations from, from the atmosphere or, or, the, or, the, or the real system out there. But sometimes they are not the most appropriate to use for, for the kind of application, sh application you're looking at, since they might be in data sparse regions or they might be in regions where models can actually sometimes even be better than the observation. So it's very good to combine the two in, in, in some neat way. And, and that's, again, what you're also saying. It needs to be done in concert with the needs from the users. I think that's really essential here. So thank you, Eric. So there, there, there are a couple more questions, but I'm afraid we're going to move on. Observations was mentioned, and Vladimir is the is the one. So Eric, maybe if you get, you can have a look at the comments and maybe reply to them if you could. Yeah. Um, so Vladimir, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, I will be talk about the observations of the chapter dedicated to observation in this report. Uh, in general, uh, we decide to split this chapter in four sub chapters dedicated for different kinds of observation, let's say, because on one side we have something which is direct observations like a station observation, and on the other side we have a product that are derived from observations like a, like a reanalysis or gridded observation. Uh, in general, observations are very re relevant for the climate services, even uh, if we use them for the basic one services like a development or production of regular climate monitoring bulletin, bulletins, uh, like a monthly or seasonal or something like that. But also observations is relevant uh, in terms of uh, indirect uh, impact on, on services like uh, for the model calibration, ver model verification, validation, or bias adjustment, or maybe at attribution studies. So in that sense, observations are really crucial for development of many different climate services. And, and as I said, we, we split this chapter in four subchapters. Now I will present uh, the four subchapters uh, here. The first one was dedicated to reanalysis during past few years, the, uh, the new reanalysis, the global one, the era five with era five land appeared and very uh, fast they become like a standard for, for use in, in, in many applications. So it, it all, the BOW data set are already recognized as, as important. Even it, it is interesting, at least for me, that, that the data from this reanalysis now compared for, for, uh, uh, with traditional a data set that, that was used for monitoring of glo about global temperature, like a NOAA data set or uh, NASA GIS or uh, uh, HUD crew in, in UK and so on. Uh, <coughs> another set of, of reanalysis that appeared uh, was the regional reanalysis the, uh, over the European continent. It was uh, UERA reanalysis, and also uh, right now it's the SERA, which is under development. Also, two Arctic sub regions will be covered with regional uh, reanalysis, uh, re uh, which is interesting be because it will be uh, probably for the first time that we have this kind of uh, reanalysis dedicated to high uh, latitudes. And uh, these reanalysis are on even, even higher resolution in comparison to, to these global data sets. It's going from 5.5 to 2.5 kilometers. Uh, many of these data sets are already av available through the Copernicus uh, climate data, data store, so it's easily accessible for many users, and I think that many users already use this, this analysis. So this, this, this story about reanalysis is one of the, of the uh, major things that, that was happened in terms of, uh, of uh, provision of, let's say, not direct observations, but this kind of uh, derived product from, uh, of observations. Uh, the another part of, of this chapter is dedicated to the gridded observations. We know that one of the most used gridded observations of, of the Europe was EOPS. The EOPS become available uh, again through the Copernicus uh, uh, C3S uh, portal. And also during the last few year, years, several uh, subcontinental data set was also become available. And I think that uh, already we have 
many parts of Europe that is covered uh, with this even uh, this uh, gridded observation that is uh, on even higher resolution in comparison to the EOPS, like a Nordic gridded climate data set and then the data dedicated to the Alpine region. Then we have in Eastern Europe, we have a Carpath Clean endemic Clean, and I think that also many other uh, different regions, we also have this uh, high resolution gridded climatologies. Uh, uh, this climatology is, uh, is used for many different applications. One of them is, let's say, the EOPS is the one of the data set that is also used for the monthly reports about uh, climate over the euro. Then we have direct observations and data rescue as a subchapter in this observation observations chapter. So uh, what we found or what, what we think or what, what is our impression is that station observations are still have high priority, even that we have all this spectrum of, of different products, which is derived from observations, which indicating the, the importance uh, of high quality and availability of this data. Unfortunately, the station's observations are, are still have some kind of limit in ter terms how we uh, access them. Uh, in that sense, the Climate Explorer is a rare example that you can easily access the, the climate observations. But again, the uh, Climate Explorer is just the front end, which is which from which you can take data from global uh, historical climatological network or ECAT database. So in that, that terms, uh, we still don't have any kind of common strategy in, in Europe or and even globally how we share these station observations and uh, which kind of let's say procedure or uh, protocol we should use when we share this or station observation still many hydrometeorological services which are in charge to, to, to maintain the meteorological networks and to provide these observations have different policies how the data is, uh, is shared. Uh, some of examples which try to make this data more easily accessible and more publicly available, it's, it's diff different initiatives from WMO or even the European Commission have this initiative on open data and their, their initiative. So uh, the last point for, for, for this sub, sub chapter is that the, during 2020, the data rescue service on Copernicus C3S will be, become operational. It, 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 it is somehow integrates the I there and ACRE initiative that was previously up here. And the last part of this chapter is dedicated to satellite, satellite observations. Satellite observations have the many advantages like uh, uh, spa spatial coverage and uh, high resolution of the observation. But on the other side, not uh, all satellite observations are long enough to be useful for the climate studies and climate services. We know that many of them are really spend just like a, for, for several years. But on, on the other side, many other products uh, uh, now are long enough to be used like uh, observation of precipitation or clouds or sea ice and so on. And also many of these satellite observations are already available again through the, this Copernicus uh, climate, data store, climate, da climate data store or, or, or other uh, front end web pages. So one of the conclusions of, uh, of this short talk is that uh, many of the data uh, which we present uh, is accessible to, to Copernicus. And in that, set, in that sense, Copernicus becomes some kind of uh, uh, crossing point to, to access all different kinds of observations to, and even to process them and, and use for, for other applications. That was from Thank my you. side. Thank you, Vladimir. So we've got another quick poll. So we'd like to ask you to see which type of observation do you think are the most important for the provision of climate services? Ground-based, i.e. local, or satellite? And if you, don't, if you can't answer the poll, then please click yes, no, and I'll can keep a tally on that. So the background is really that, that through many conversations, and I think also on the chat, there was issues about people wanting local data. Um, so I guess uh, access to even basic things like weather station data, is that actually, is that one of the bottlenecks? Um, we obviously have a, a fair amount of satellite data. Um, 
which is obviously important from a global point of view and weather assimilation, but where are we with the ground based? So can I suggest that those who aren't able to vote via the poll, the, the question has to be slightly rephrased for your yes, no. So the options are ground based against satellite. So can you click yes, if you think ground based observations are more important and no, if you think satellite. Okay, so, so far, so we got good, um, a good measure of, uh, of response. So we've got about, again, over half have responded and we have a majority we can end the poll probably now, which, so we have a majority, we can end the poll, and I can share the results. So we have a majority, which is the importance of ground base, which doesn't really surprise me because I, when you, often you talk to people, they start off by just asking about, well, what's my local rainfall, my local temperature? And that's often the starting point um, for many conversations. So I'm, I'm not surprised to, to, to see that. Okay, so anything, oops, sorry, there was, Roger, you had a question or a comment? You wanna oh, unmute yourself? Yes, Rolf, I, it was a difficult question to answer, primarily because a lot of information that is not available on a local scale because of the decreasing quality and quantity of observations, uh, ground-based observations, is available by satellite and that is the information you know satellite is moving more and more into that type of information so it's a difficult question to answer i was just suggesting because both of them are needed and uh in if we keep decreasing the quality of the uh, and quantity of observations we're going to have to keep moving more and more into satellite and rather remote information I think the motivation for the question is that, as you know, the, the space sort of takes care of its own lobby group. So we have the European Space Agency, we have you know, lots of space initiatives, but the ground-based stuff is often very fragmented across Europe. So I think it was partly probably an issue there of accessibility of local data is maybe one barrier. I think, I think you know, it is a problem and it's, it's something we're going to have to look at anyways. But access to space is going to data is going to be as I just say it's a difficult question to answer. So uh, Philip, you've been very active, but you've not had a chance to say anything. So I'll give you the chance to say something. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ralph, for the <laughs> giving the floor. Oh, it's it's a very good discussion, and uh, yeah, I think uh, we all agree on on this last question. Uh, Working with users, I think if you have, um, if Earth observation has something, let's say, uh, still a bit romantic, uh, far away from them. So uh, uh, local data um, really, really helps to, to communicate with the users and also to validate uh, your services. So uh, I voted for, for local, local data in this one, but uh, as a researcher, um, as a climate service delivery organization, I think we, we are also looking into earth observation data and we are we do have a wish list of, of, of better earth observation data, better time 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 resolution and so on. So uh, yeah, I would say both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Sam from ECWF, and like a similar comment from from Stijin from ECWF. Maybe you can have one voice from ECMWF. Sam, do you want to speak on behalf of those two ECMWF? Sure, very happy to, and thank you. It's a really interesting discussion, but I think you know it comes back to what question are you trying to answer, and and you know, what scale is that question relevant for? And, and I think you know as a community, we do really need to look at, particularly in a, a post-COVID world where budgets are shrinking, how do we ensure there is fragmentation in, in ground-based data observations so that, you know, we do have these holistic data sets that are useful for um, climate service users at a range of different scales. So, 
you know, for me, that's the more interesting question of, of how do we get better collaboration and, and you know, more available access to credible, high quality data. Thanks. Thank you. So there's Vladimir, there's some more questions there. If you could answer them in the chat and uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. Time's moving on. Okay. To Marta. Marta, are you there? Yes. I'm here. I'm just sharing my screen. Can you okay. see it? I can see it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, so yeah, uh, hi everyone. My name is Marta Terrado. I'm a science communication specialist at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I'm going to quickly summarize uh, chapter five of this uh, report, which is about the integration of climate modeling and climate services. In this chapter, uh, we have focused on four different aspects or, or types of activities that can help strengthen the, the collaboration between these two communities. But of course, there are other, other aspects that could have been mentioned, and I would like to invite you after this uh, short presentation to, to share them with us, because for sure you, you will highlight some things that are missing. Uh, but for now, ju just uh, leave, uh, leave me uh, go quickly through these four points, and hopefully they will give you some food uh, for thought. So the first one that I want to strengthen is the, the um, and that could help this collaboration is the joint design of, uh, of simulations. As you can see in this graph, uh, you, you can see the mean temperature in Svalbard, uh, how it has increased since 1971. Actually, it has increased uh, five degrees uh, in average. And uh, under the, the, the current climate change context, uh, this, this region are fa is facing uh, challenges that are unprecedented. And uh, for example, landslides and avalanche are being more common there and uh, different adaptation measures uh, need to be uh, put in place. For instance, uh, you can see these barriers that protect the houses uh, from avalanche. And, um, as you can see here, Arid Olsen, which is a resident in Svalbard, say we can pave the way for the wall. We have to adapt a whole city. And this illustrates how our people in Svalbard and people around the world are uh, of climate change and the, cha and the challenges that it poses. However, uh, one of the things that we strengthen in the, in the report is that there is a lack of feedback sometimes from, from the community. Uh, to the, the climate modeling um, community. So, so I mean from the local community to the climate modeling community. Now, if I move to the second uh, point of integration, we, we pointed out that uh, inter and transdisciplinary approaches are, is something that, that is needed. In the last years, there has been a lot of work um, and a lot of progress in the development of co-production frameworks that can be applied to different settings. Uh, but uh, the, there are uh, some disciplines that, that maybe are less taken into account, although, uh, I, I repeat, some things uh, are improving. So disciplines like social sciences, humanities, also design, data visualization, and user-centered design uh, are fields that have uh, very well-established methodologies. And th these methodologies can highly benefit the climate science uh, community and also the stakeholders uh, that are in need of these uh, climate services. User-centered design, for instance, instance, puts a special emphasis in reducing the user cognitive load, so the effort that users need uh, to, to put when they are uh, using climate services um, to perform uh, particular tasks or taking some, some specific decisions. Um, we, it's important also to highlight that we need to move towards an operationalization, so to have an operational collaboration between research, policy, and also the, the civil society. And we, we are seeing more and more that uh, the, the, the climate services and also the climate science communities are, are uh, developing some reports, like less technical reports, policy briefs, white reports, and so on, that um, are addressed to the, to the policy community and that reach actually the policy community. But sometimes this feedback from the policy community to, to our community, to climate science, climate services, uh, climate modeling communities, uh, is not, uh, doesn't work. So, so we need to find these mechanisms also to have this feedback. 
The third point that we identified was artificial intelligence and uh, as, as a game changer for climate change. So artificial intelligence um, refers to computer systems that can sense the environment and think from the environment, learn and act in response to, to, to all the, the different uh, big data and stimulus uh, that, that are received. And for instance, uh, the, the field of artificial intelligence has helped climate researchers to determine uh, which models are more, more reliable, giving more weight uh, to, to those that provide predictions that eventually are found to be more accurate and giving more weight to other predictions that are more poor, that perform more poorly. Uh, also, uh, artificial intelligence has been applied to identify uh, better tropical cyclones, uh, atmospheric rivers, and also extreme events. And uh, it, it, the, the good point of artificial intelligence is that it, it allows incorporating many aspects of the real world that are very complex and that can be taken into account in the, in the simulations and in the calculations. Uh, it has also been applied in the field of uh, disaster risk reduction and to determine strategies to, 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 deal, to deal more effectively with the disasters. And this means that has this potential to, to advise policy as well. And finally, the, the last point that we have developed is uh, the, the need to communicate uh, climate change in a different way. Um, this, uh, there is a need to, me, to, to, to bring these facts and, and output of scientific calculations close to, to the user community, to the user's experiences, uh, actually. And uh, a lot has been done uh, recently as well, uh, developing uh, narratives uh, that try to put some context to all the scientific results, but uh, we, 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 we cannot just stop at the narrative level. There are, there are other tools that have been applied to better communicate and also to better engage with users. And here there are some of them. We can talk about the storylines and case studies, which are normally a little bit more technical. They describe uh, how the weather and climate will unfold under future situations, or sometimes they describe past uh, events that were especially relevant for stakeholders because they affected their economies and so on. Then uh, we have the narratives that I have already mentioned, uh, putting some values and backgrounds and experiences of stakeholders into context and that can help better explain how these climate facts, these climate events affect uh, the, the, different, the different stakeholders. And, uh, but then uh, there are uh, also other tools or other applications, for instance, online platforms that can be decision support tools that are better tailored to the users, or we can even go further and, and talk about games, citizen science, and all these artistic representations uh, that, that also help to empathize uh, a little bit. And uh, here I finish with the description of, of this chapter. And now, well, you f feel free to ask me, but also I, I can talk only about my own experience. So I also invite you to, to point out uh, like different uh, points that, that should have been included maybe, or that could be included in future um, summaries. Thank, Thank you. So again, we have the last poll. Um, this one is a little bit more involved so i'm afraid there's going to be no yes no option here this is a little bit more involved so you're going to have to enter the poll so the question is which activity would you prioritize so prioritization is the key word in order to strengthen the links between climate modeling and climate services joint design implementation of transdisciplinary approaches application of ai co-development communication tools so can I suggest that those people who can't see the poll, we could, if you think the answer is joint, or the most important priority is joint design of simulations, click yes. Implementation of transdisciplinary approaches, click no. Application of artificial intelligence, click go slower. And co-development of communication tools, click go faster. Okay, you sort of broken up a little bit there. So I think what Paula was suggesting, if you're in your bottom, you go one, two, three, four, yes, no, go slower, go faster, you can enter that way. But we're already getting some interesting, interesting uh, throughput here. So we can, now we have 66% participation, excellent, so we're getting up. 
So it's very interesting. Nobody believes in AI here. Well, two people do. <laughs> Only two people. Uh, so I think we'll end it. And we can share the results. So quite striking. So I'm a little bit surprised, Marta. I'm, I'm not surprised at the AI, the too many old people on here, but I'm not surprised. I am a little bit surprised by how little people think joint design of simulations is important. Maybe because we made them prioritize, you know, uh, they should be important, but as people could only choose one, uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's the result of that. Yeah, but it's quite clearly not a priority. And then you have two which are about equal, the transdisciplinary approaches and your, your communication tools. What's your reaction to that, Marta? To me, it looks good because uh, actually, uh, when we talk about this joint design of simulations, we are focusing a lot on on, on the um, simulation, so in, on the science, uh, on the uh, climate science field. Sorry. So, so we are we are a little bit, although we take into account how this will impact the users eventually. Uh, we are more focused in, in the science per se. So, I like to see that uh, approaches that take into account this transdisciplinarity and this uh, co-development uh, have received like a like a higher uh, amount of, of answers so so to me it looks it looks great <laughs> okay. so I open the floor any questions um, looking at the chat so there's a grizzly AI question is too generic but anyway that's that's fair enough but what else can you do it's always going to be generic uh, any other questions or comments? So it's so there's a number of questions there. I don't know if you want to answer those, Marta, or if people want to speak up if they want to say something. Yeah, if they want to 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 ask directly, it would be better than yeah. yeah. So if you feel strongly enough, raise your, unmute yourself and so I see Mark, Paco and Philip have made some Hello. Yes. Yeah. Can I just, uh, I was wondering joint design of simulations. Is this something you uh, think of uh, between, between the end users and the ones delivering the climate services or, or more an internal climate service community activity? Yeah, it was quite open in the report, but uh, uh, what we were pointing out is that there is not this communication between the stakeholders, so people that are living, that are suffering climate change on the ground and the climate modeling community. But of course, this is something that it, it doesn't exist because it's not easy. And normally in between you have uh, this uh, climate services community and people that uh, are working as intermediaries. But anyway, even if you have all this structure, the users, the intermediaries, and the climate modeling community, it's, it's difficult. So, so ideally, it would be a di direct communication between the stakeholders and the climate modeling community. But th this is not happening. But even if you have some in-betweeners, this could be improved. This was uh, basically the idea. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else anybody want to raise before we move on to the next? So anika has got a little link there. Just thank you for that and the communication. The Dalek. 